A new investigation by the New York Times uh, looked into a drone strike that was conducted by the United States military in 2019. This is during the Trump administration. And the drone strike was something that honestly ended up being a complete and utter disaster. And uh, it's clear from the reporting that the New York Times did that the Pentagon went out of its way to ensure there was a cover-up for this drone strike because of the death toll involving civilians. Now, um, look, drone strikes have led to so many civilian casualties, um, you know, not just in Syria. We've, we've seen it in Iraq, Afghanistan, just complete and utter disaster. The Obama administration callously referred to civilian deaths as a result of drone strikes as uh, collateral damage, uh, further adding insult to injury. Um, but this is a case where a drone strike was conducted under the Trump administration, who uh, went out of his way to stop any government reporting on drone strikes and the number of civilian casualties. But that doesn't mean that the drone strike stopped. So here's the specific drone strike I'm referring to. This happened in March 18th of 2019. Members of the once fierce caliphate were cornered in a dirt field next to a town called Baguz. Um, a U.S. military drone circled high overhead, hunting for military targets, but it saw only a large crowd of women and children huddled against a riverbank. All right, so you see women and children. You, you don't see enemy combatants. You know, you don't see uh, so-called terrorists. Women and children, giant group of people, right? Well, without warning, an American F-15E attack jet streaked across the drone's high-definition field of vision and dropped a 500-pound bomb on the crowd, swallowing it in a shuddering blast. As the smoke cleared, a few people stumbled away in search of cover. Then a jet tracking them dropped one 2,000-pound bomb, then another, killing most of the survivors. And by the way, there was shock among some members of the military immediately. Um, so there were personnel watching live as this was happening. And some of them, according to the New York Times, were stunned. Uh, they were in disbelief, especially because it was clear that there were so many women and children in that group that had just been um, hit not once, not twice, but three different times. Now, uh, the correct number for uh, casualties is 70. OK, so. Um, and we're talking about civilian casualties here. A legal officer flagged a strike or flagged the strike as a possible war crime and required an investigation. But at nearly every step, the military made moves that concealed the catastrophic site uh, strike. The death toll was downplayed. Reports were delayed, sanitized and classified. United States led coalition forces bulldozed the blast site. The top leaders weren't even notified that this happened. Um, and it just keeps getting worse. It's just very clear that uh, not only was there a high number of civilian casualties from this particular uh, strike, but the military just went out of its way to pretend like this wasn't a big deal. It need didn't need to be investigated. The bombing had been called in by a classified American Special Operations Unit, Task Force 9, which was in charge of ground operations in Syria. The task force operated in such secrecy that at times it did not inform even its own military partners of its actions. In the case of the bombing, the American Air Force Command in Qatar had no idea the strike was even coming, an officer who served at the command center said. And since this was a potential war crime, an alarmed Air Force intelligence officer called on the Air Force lawyer in charge to determine whether this was something that needed to be investigated. Air Force lawyer Lieutenant Colonel Dean Corsak believed he had witnessed possible war crimes and repeatedly pressed his leadership and Air Force criminal investigators to act. When they did not, he alerted the Defense Department's independent inspector general. And then two years after the strike, seeing no evidence that the watchdog agency was taking action, Colonel Corsak emailed the Senate Armed Services Committee telling its staff that he needed or he had top secret material to discuss and adding, quote, I'm putting myself at great risk of military retaliation for sending this. By the way, uh, he's no longer he is no longer um, employed in that position. So uh, he was retaliated against, but he clearly was trying to do the right thing here. He also wrote this senior ranking U.S. military officials intentionally and systematically circumvented the deliberate strike process. A unit had intentionally entered false 
strike log entries, clearly seeking to cover up the incidents. And uh, by the way, they were supposed to save all video um, evidence of what had occurred, uh, the video um, evidence of the strikes that had occurred uh, for an independent investigation. But again, that investigation never happened. Also, the Times reports that um, it sent its findings to U.S. Central Command, which oversaw the air war in Syria. The command acknowledged the strikes for the first time, saying 80 people were killed. But the airstrikes were justified. They were totally okay. Now, it said the bombs killed 16 fighters and four civilians. As for the other 60 people, the statement said it was not clear that they were civilians, in part because women and children in the Islamic State sometimes took up arms. So that's nice. Uh, go ahead and do these strikes, kill dozens of women and children, refuse to do an investigation into what happened, tamper with the evidence, and then more importantly, at the end, try to blame this on the very victims, on the women and children who were slaughtered by these strikes, uh, try to paint them as dangerous terrorist or an imminent threat. It's absolutely insane. But it doesn't surprise me because this is a similar reaction that we got following a drone strike that took place in Afghanistan, in Kabul, not too uh, long ago. This was while U.S. troops were uh, withdrawing from Afghanistan. There was uh, an ISIS-K strike near the Kabul airport, uh, and you know it was a suicide uh, bombing, and a lot of people died. Uh, Afghan people died. Some um, members of the U.S. military died as well. And in retaliation, the Biden administration signed off on a drone strike that ended up killing um, no enemy combatants, no terrorists, no members of ISIS. Uh, it was just an Afghan family many of those who died were children. And so there was a, a, a there was an invest, investigation into that. And uh, the outcome of the investigation was there was no wrongdoing on behalf of the United States military, no wrongdoing on behalf of the Pentagon, just great investigative um, look at a drone strike that wiped out nearly an entire family in Afghanistan. So, you know, when you have that context in mind, it's not that surprising to read a story like this. And I do want to give uh, the New York Times credit for when they get some really important reporting out there. You know, they don't always get it right. Certainly, they don't get it right when it comes to foreign policy issues oftentimes. But in this case, I think it's important for Americans to understand, you know, when we talk about the atrocities carried out by Assad, I think it's important to acknowledge that and not minimize it or pretend like it doesn't exist because that's insulting to the people of Syria, insulting to the people who have lost family members as a result of his brutality. But I've always uh, remained consistent in not, in not wanting the United States to intervene in these types of conflicts because the United States never intervenes with the thought of human rights in mind. Uh, if they had that kind of mentality, if that was really the purpose or the objective of the United States military, um, they wouldn't uh, try to cover up these types of disgusting drone strikes, which take place all the time. Kale. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it seems totally insane and, and senseless and just downright evil, I think it's because it is. I mean, there it's like, it's kind of our continued like military presence in this part of the world truly just is kind of mind blowing because like at some level, you know, we've covered before, you know, like who profits off of this, but I really think it's like, it's a portion of the American ruling class. It's not even most of the ruling class. I, I really think that like, at this point, uh, actually, Andrew Coburn, who we had on a few weeks ago, made this point that it's like the the military budget keeps going up year after year, almost unexplainably as well. And then uh, the fact is that they have all of these resources and they decide we have to put them to use. And so they end up creating greater conflict and greater war because they need to actually use all this stuff that they just purchased. Uh, but it's not like the U.S. is not trying to colonize Syria. It's not trying to like spread democracy, obviously. It's not trying right. to spread humanitarianism. It's not like Syria is not like a major threat to American capitalist interests. It's not like, you know, you could say at some level there's some kind of geopolitical, you know, maneuvering of I don't I mean, I think like you could definitely say that about Iraq and Afghanistan. And and again, we'll talk to Tariq in a little bit about Afghanistan, but uh, at this point, I think like a lot of this is just like they have this equipment, they're going to keep using it, like they're just going to keep like 
destroying these countries and these people's lives uh and uh and obviously nothing's going to happen to these people because like that's it th there is kind of this structural incentive to keep this going and yet there's nothing that holds these people accountable there's no true counterweight because locally you know this is like at this point syria is barely a country they have like yeah. there's barely anything like resisting us locally and then domestically we just don't have a true anti-war movement or, or or like you know a left in in power or in government that can like actually you know put some checks on on the this military power and this like you know just this grotesque horrible international militarism it's it's just it's a situation where like this terrible horrible thing happens it there's nothing there to stop it and it doesn't really it's not even like I think like people will go too far and say like because something horrible is happening it must be because like you know it's, it's the system needs it or that like the ruling class broadly like really wants this and I really think it's like a small chunk of people that are getting away because there's nothing that's going to stop this from happening. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right about that. I mean, there was that story, uh, his name escapes me at the moment, but the, there was a Navy SEAL, essentially, who was uh, eventually pardoned by Donald Trump. Uh, and Navy SEALs who worked with him um, were the ones who turned him in because he mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, doing some pretty disgusting, terrible things to... Um, I believe it was in Iraq. I apologize. I didn't expect to bring this up. Um, but I, it's, it's a relevant story because even when there are instances of maybe some accountability, mm -hmm. in the end, there's someone who lets them go free, even if they've been found to do pretty terrible things, whether it's intentionally targeting uh, civilians in Middle Eastern countries that we're occupying, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, like Abu Ghraib is a great example, mm -hmm. the way that we were treating. And by the way, the way that we're um, still detaining people in Gitmo, in Guantanamo Bay, and the United States government has acknowledged that many of those people um, don't even really have any charges against them, but they just don't know what to do with them. So we literally have innocent people who are still locked away in Guantanamo Bay, and the United States is just keeping them there because they're terrified of what kind of retaliation will come if they let them go. There's something strange about this where it's the situation is almost in a in like moment of being stuck. It's like we can't get out of this. And it's this is the problem we're facing across the board. Like if we just kind of zoom out of just like American foreign policy or militarism. Like this is kind of part of the crisis of neoliberalism right now where uh, it's the system has clearly like it's destroying most people's lives it's crushing most people and yet there's nothing that most people seem to be able to do to actually change this structure that it's like the weight of the structure and the fact that like it has its own like it has rules for why it keeps going it has like certain incentives and punishments that are in place uh it's just it's it's something that we cannot yet overcome and yet we have to live with like you know all of the brutality that appears on a day-to-day -day basis and um, and in any one instance, it looks inexplicable that it doesn't make sense why we live in this horrible, cruel world. And yet, uh, I think it largely, it's just, you know, it's these like manifestations of, of like a, a system that is truly only benefiting a few people. And there's nothing really, and even like in, there's in ways where like, they're not even benefiting as much as they possibly could. I mean, uh, there's, you know everyone is kind of stuck in just the sheer weight of the structure of of whatever this kind of if you want to still call it neoliberalism or, or whatever it is but uh and and so you know as horrible as it is it's you know it's not going to change fundamentally until there is some other kind of countervailing force and so historically that's been you know the power of of organized labor uh mm -hmm. and the creation of the welfare state and hopefully that's, that's it and that's, I mean, that's hopefully it. that's what we're going to try to, you know, build towards, but that's, those are the stakes, I think. Yeah. I, um, I've entered a, a new phase of my political ideology. I don't know if it's a good phase or a bad phase, but, um, look, I don't want to, I don't want to be one of those people who discourages voters from engaging in electoral politics. That's, that's not my objective and it never will be. But I personally think that 
relying heavily on electoral politics to solve our problems is the biggest mistake we can make. Like yeah. at this point, I mean, vote strategically, but I have no faith in the Democratic Party. Gone. Yeah. Absolutely gone at this point. So yeah. anyway. Well, in the in the very last time, and then we'll and then we'll get on to our sponsor. But I mean it's it's a problem of insufficient democracy. It's like the fact is that like you can vote, but like the actual electoral system and the political system is set up such that like your ability to do something democratic in society is so limited that like the answer is an expansion of democracy and a good chance yes. of that's going to have to be the expansion of democracy in the workplace. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way you'll enjoy all of our backlog as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.